Thank you very much, Reto, for the invitation. It's great to be here, and as far as I can see, all the people here are very nice. We met yesterday together. It feels like a family already to me, so I'm glad to make this speech, and I'm glad that Muharrem is here. We have devised our speech basically in two parts. I will do like the introduction and the main problems we're facing, and Muharrem is here to help us with the details on technology and business. As Ritu said, I'm a journalist now for 20 years and the last years um, full-time. And my experience from this time, if you haven't experienced it yourself, um, is that media is broken and that no one fixes this so far. So we will change that. Censorship is rampant. We have seen the Twitter files. We have seen uh, high-class epidemiologists being censored on social media. People are scared to utter their opinion freely. Cancel culture is on the rise. There's a whole censorship industrial complex rising. And we are in a hybrid warfare with this complex, which is basically a war between the populations of the world and this complex. Journalists are hiding away, going into exile, like I did in Switzerland, or they're sitting in jail like Julian Assange. What is at stake? Our achievements in the West are based on free and uncensored encounter of ideas and opinions. We have no better process historically than the ideal of a marketplace of ideas. Bring ideas to the marketplace, put them to test, earn new insights and learn. That's the process, basically, how the West uh, could thrive. It's a process of trial and error. It's the basis of evolution and the ground stone for human process and progress. Freedom of speech is the matrix of democracy. It's the heart. Hannah Arendt once said, without clarity and transparency on facts, freedom of speech and freedom of opinion becomes a farce. We are now entering this phase. Censorship is like robbery. It's like the robbery of, of ideas. But it's a robbery that is hidden for a long time. Due to a common effect that we know from behavioral economics, uh, Daniel Kahneman, maybe you know him, wrote about this effect. The effect is called, what you see is all there is. So our brain functions on positivity. We encounter ideas and we can process them, but we don't see or we don't process what we don't see. So when information gets censored for a long time, we don't feel the effect. But later on, we feel that debates are getting narrowed down, that it's getting sterile, that there's fear of uttering opinions and so on. What is the solution? We want to turn the marketplace of ideas into reality with technological means. We want to build the first open source, decentralized and censorship resistant publishing platform for investigative citizen journalism, powered by Nostr and Bitcoin Lightning. There are two main power sources in society, money and information. Both are forms of communication. They are means of exchange, and they classically belong to the people going bottom up and not top down. Money tells you the price of a good. Information creates our reality. Media, through manipulation, can change the perception of reality. What we must do is to gain the freedom back to the citizens and invert the pyramid, overcome the power of oligarchic cartels. Bitcoin, as you know, is leading the way as far as money is concerned. It's the first really hard money of the information age. It's a consensus-based system that rewards good actors and punishes bad actors. Some call it a truth machine. We need a similar truth machine for information as well, which of course always will be just an approximation of truth as this process never ends. We need hard information as an analog to hard money in the hands of the citizens. 
We want to build, therefore, a platform that unites researchers and journalists on different layers. A place where everybody could start a publication, like a blog or a newsletter. A place where informations are compiled, tagged, pooled and checked, taken from other sources, can be scientific journals, can be Twitter, can be everything. A place where researchers and journalists can work together, crowdfund their work, sell subscriptions or get donations based on hard money through Bitcoin and Lightning. And a place where the process of truth approximation is visualized so that everybody can see in only a matter of minutes how strong the factual basis of a topic is, made beyond 9-11, vaccine injuries, Nord Stream or any other topic. A place where every piece of information can be challenged at all times, put to the test and ameliorated. That's the basic idea in the short time that I have, because we want to have more time for the discussion, of course. We want to hear your ideas. And now I would love to give the word to my honorable colleague, maybe the questions afterwards. <laughs> and uh, yes, I give the micro to Muharrem. Thank you, Milos. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Muharrem. I am um, Milos's partner. Speak up, louder. OK. I'm Milos's partner. And um, as he mentioned, I cover the technological angle. All right, so <clears throat> Milos uh, set the stage, the backdrop for what it is that we want to achieve. Uh, once the Pareto platform becomes a reality, what kind of um, user flows or user journeys or features it will provide. And so the major feature is obviously um, the hosting of content, so to allow journalists or uh, any kind of content creator to host their content on our platform, whether it be free or paid. Also to conduct research, to publish uh, inputs for content creators on the platform and to allow them to discover uh, research. And um, yeah, last but not least, to collaborate, to discuss, to challenge uh, any content that is on the platform. Uh, from a technological perspective, uh, we would like to be efficient. So we, let me give you an analogy. When you build a skyscraper, approximately 70% of the cost, maybe not, let's say 60 or 70% of the cost is digging the hole and pouring the concrete for the foundations, all right? And then building, erecting the actual building on top is much less effort. And so, we don't want to build the foundations. The uh, foundations already exist, and we want to utilize them. We want to stand on the shoulders of giants and build Pareto proper, the actual platform. And we want to be efficient in, in that manner. And so, as Milos mentioned, one of the foundations we want to utilize is Bitcoin. Okay? Um, we need to be censorship resistant. And if you remember the early days of WikiLeaks, once WikiLeaks became a thing, the first thing that shut down was the credit card payments to WikiLeaks, right? So once we become significant, and um, obviously we'll be attacked, and the first line of attack is traditional finance. So we need to use Bitcoin for all flows, for all like uh, value flows on our platform. So this is the first foundation layer. The second foundation layer is called Noster, and um, I just had the pleasure to talk to some Noster uh, developers. I came back from the Bitcoin Atlantis conference uh, in Madeira, which uh, took place um, a week ago. And so Noster is an open source technology, a decentralized technology that is very generic in nature, which in essence just um, facilitates the exchange of information. It's like a switchboard. It's like a, it's like a thing where you can send messages, publish messages on it, and others can consume them, right? Obviously, it provides a little bit, a bit more. And you, you can label them, tag them, organize them in certain ways. But what is important is that Nostra has been uh, built up from the ground uh, with this open source and mm, censorship resistance ethos. And so it is a very suitable uh, foundational technological layer for us to build upon. So, 
I can obviously talk more <laughs> about how, how it works, etc. but I, I think I just want to characterize that we are seeking this efficiency in what we seek to achieve, and there are great foundations and great open source technologies uh, that you can already uh, bootstrap upon and utilize. Likewise, our system will be open source. We think um, in order to achieve the um, trust and uh, the resilience and robustness, uh, we need uh, our system also has to be open source and uh, uh, it, it needs to be monetized in, in different ways than just selling licenses or selling software. All right, last but not least, um, once Pareto becomes a reality and once it sees wide scale adoption, it will become something of an orange pilling machine. What does this mean? Well, people will be forced or will elect to use Pareto, to live on Pareto, uh, to host the content, participate in discussions or research, etc. And in order to uh, participate actively, they will need to have Bitcoin, uh, Lightning, all right? So uh, many people uh, who want to, uh, who understand the importance of, the, of a marketplace of free ideas uh, will come to our platform and will not have Bitcoin yet will not have had the chance or the opportunity to use Bitcoin. So in order to participate, they will need to acquire Bitcoin. And we will make this easy, as easy as possible, by maybe uh, uh, pulling partners on, on the platform, which allow people to convert fiat uh, to Bitcoin and Lightning. But nevertheless, whoever wishes or desires or is keen to participate actively on Pareto will need Bitcoin. And thus, Pareto will become an orange building machine. Um, I want to sp I, I want to s leave some space for discussion, and so I'm basically just racing through these couple of slides. And one thing I want to speak to is the market validation and size uh, aspect of Pareto. So, as you know, Milos is a fairly well-known persona um, already, and so we are in contact. We already know uh, more than ten content creators who are interested in coming onto Pareto. Why are they interested? Well, because today, they need to weigh every single word. When they publish on YouTube or wherever, there's an imminent danger that they will uh, publish content which is uh, not tolerated by these platforms and that they will, that they will be actually deplatformed. They will lose their audience, they will lose uh, their, their income, etc., etc. So. Uh, these people, these content creators, they want to come onto Pareto as soon as it becomes available. And who is coming with them? Well, their followers, the people who want to consume the content. So we're speaking like five million followers or more. So typically, uh, these followers, like 10% of the followers, pay something either uh, by donating or by paying a subscription fees to the content creators. And we're talking, let's say, sixty dollars maybe a year. So. Uh, if we get uh, if we get a ten percent of of these uh, of these payments as fees, we would uh, turn around our revenue of three million USD in year uh, one straight away. So this is uh, this is like a common this is like a public good. Pareto is public good. is it it, it is meant uh, to serve the society, but it is also a profitable platform. This is a business. And so this is just the beginning. Uh, we begin with content hosting, but we, this will be a highly agile, nimble, and experimental project. So we will roll out features uh, in a very fast fashion, see what sticks, and basically monetize the platform in many, many ways, uh, which we cannot even envision at, at this point in time. So the roadmap. Um, let me go to the other side. So. In essence, uh, as you can see from this little uh, graphic on the right-hand side, we need to roll out the base platform. We need to roll out release one. Okay. And release one will have uh, a web client, so you, you will be able to consume it everywhere uh, where you use a browser. Um, and that web client will already offer content hosting, discussion threads, tagging, and searching, as well as Bitcoin integration, Lightning. And it will be underpinned by a replicated and geo-distributed backend. Okay, if you ever used, I mean, Bitcoin is sort of peer-to-peer, -peer, 
If you kill one Bitcoin node, you haven't achieved anything. The network still ch is chugging along. The same is true actually for BitTorrent. If you ever used BitTorrent in the olden days, um, basically the nodes that use the system underpin the system, so you can't kill it. And this is something very important. And so, again, we estimate that uh, we need a year and $2 million to build this base platform on top of Nostra and Bitcoin. And the idea is to roll it out in four releases. We would have quarterly releases. So we don't want to build something and sit on it for a year. We'll be releasing like every three months, maybe even more often, just to uh, show uh, the community and everybody how things are going and what progress we are making. Once this is up and running, uh, there are multiple ways how we can proceed. Right? So you see we have three releases, uh, tagged 2A, 2B, and 2C, and they, they all these releases package different kinds of features. So release 2A uh, would allow us to uh, package uh, the nodes that underpin Pareto and allow anybody to run these nodes. So basically, we would, uh, we would be like, this would be true decentralization and true distribution. Anybody could just spin up, a, spin up a Pareto node and run it and operate it and receive operator rewards for doing so. Um, 2B uh, is envisions um, a request for content. So let's say there's a journalist, there's Seymour Hirsch, and somebody wants Seymour to cover a certain topic, so they could uh, put out a, a request for content and also uh, found it by bounties uh, or by, by crowdfunding. So this is then basically journalism or content on demand, and obviously there's an escrow feature. And th the last release would be um, Basically, a kind of a yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a research pool where anybody can submit information and refine this information to various degrees to make this like a a fertile ground for journalists or other content creators to discover facts and to discover research upon which they can draw and then publish like finished content. So this is the vision as it stands in a nutshell, and now. Your questions, please. Why Pareto principle? Is it something to do with how you're going to shape the discussions? Or, for example, in ESG, we see that the citations tend to all be the same people over and over and over again. So it's self-referential, in effect. Is there some sort of function like that to say that where 80% of the references are the same, that you treat it like it's only 20% true? Is, is that what's going on there? The question is why it's called Pareto. And, and what that means yeah, okay. operationally. <laughs> uh, Pareto was an economist, as uh, maybe some of uh, you may know, and he's known for the Pareto principle, which basically says, as you say it, uh, that 20% uh, of the efforts are responsible for 80% of the outcomes. And uh, what we want to show by this is uh, that basically a small group of people already in the media system can make a big difference. If we can uh, get the critical mass into critical publishing, uh, this changes the media landscape already. So we don't have to, we don't need full control of any media system. It's enough when some people do good work and it uh, immediately extrapolates on the rest. And also, Pareto is known for his circle of elites. So he showed in his work how old elites are replaced by new elites. And we think that uh, decentralization and the whole idea around Bitcoin shows this idea in the best way that we are now in an era where the old elites uh, will be replaced by, by new things. So it's more like a... I'm also an artist as a journalist, so I, I love uh, met metaphors and uh, that's why I use the name Pareto. But it can be changed. It's for the moment a name that we didn't really even discuss or agree on. I just put it on. <laughs> Guido? Hi. Um, I like the idea very much. So um, the, if I'm now very open, please take it just to support the project. Um, the, the first thing what comes to my mind, um, can you please explain again how it works, the approval of uh, information in the system? Uh, second, I would really think about 
incorporating a press association who can release press uh, ID cards. Um, it's not protected, so it can be done by a lot of things, and this would give the, the whole platform maybe an additional booster and also an additional income because you can charge such an ID card for maybe 60 or, uh, or 80 dollars. And uh, a lot of influencers and uh, people um, who are working there, they don't get this ID cards by the official or by the, the established organization, so it could be a, a, a nice side topic. And the third one is uh, I would really take a little bit more on the presentation. It's very simple now. And, and if I see a lot of presentations and I say, um, if you want to have this money and everything, then maybe a little bit taking more, that it makes it a little bit more fancy and uh, a little bit more um, yeah, modern in, in a way um, at, uh, if you present it to any investors, as a, just as a recommendation. Maybe I go on the topic of uh, the second question was, um, I forgot it already. <laughs> the press, uh, the press cards. Well, the press cards. Um, I don't know if they're really useful, to be honest. In Switzerland, I don't have a press card, and I don't know any journalist who has one and needed one ever. So what I have seen from Germany is that there are a lot of associations that are selling these cards, like showing show us that you have published three articles and then you get a card for fifty bucks. I've done that in the past as well because I used these cards when I was in France to get entry to the opera or stuff like this, <laughs> so it can be helpful. But isn't it a little bit a, a old age uh, thing to show, hey, I have this card, now I'm a journalist. Um, I think the way we are going is proof what you bring in your work. And if it's good, people will recognize you as a journalist. They will eventually pay you, they will forward your work, and you will gather your, let's say, prominence or your, um, yeah, your, your rise through, through the masses and maybe not through a, through a card. On the fanciness of uh, presentations, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, are, we could do a more fancy, fancy approach, of course. Uh, we were thinking that here is a maybe not a public that we have to sell something to them and I basically have seen so many presentations where there are big nice uh, pictures and graphs and so and I always thought it's a kind of yeah a masquerade maybe and that's why we wanted to keep it a little bit technical because we also thought that you are more interested in the core and maybe less in the in the nice and fancy paintings, but uh, why not? Of course, uh, it's how, how you sell an idea, of course, and it's, the package is also important, so we take that absolutely serious and we can do better. <laughs> and maybe I give... The third one know. was to explain again how this approval process of your platform, this would be nice. Guido. Yes, maybe I can speak. Yes, I will come forward, but first get the answer, then I need to correct. <laughs> Maybe I can speak to, um, to content moderation. So the, the Pareto platform will have uh, content guidelines. So we will disallow certain things. For example, child pornography will not be allowed. Okay. And so if, so if anything is posted which violates the content guidelines, which will be very, very uh, few in number and very uh, uh, basic, uh, the content will be taken down. So this is one aspect of it. The other aspect is um, one idea we're considering is uh, for the community to be able to buy something called a validator ticket. It's a bit, it's a, it's a bit like a proof of stake uh, in the blockchain. So you buy a validator ticket and uh, it matures for a month. And if, if some kind of content is posted which people think it should not be on the platform, it gets flagged by any user says, I think this should not be on, on, on Pareto. Okay. And then we can draw seven random validated, validated tickets and the validators will look at the content and be, if they vote, it, it should be taken down, they'll take it down. If they vote, it should stay, it, it, it'll stay. So this is the current thinking of how we want to deal uh, A, with content that violates uh, the, the guidelines so there's no debate there, we take it on. But if something is controversial or flagged as inappropriate, uh, we want to basically uh, enforce, we want to have the community, the, valid, uh, the validators, 
take a look at it, and um, uh, we want the community to take these decisions. What should be up or down? I think what Guido and I are both asking that hasn't really been answered, because my point was, is Pareto to do with how you validate information? Is, are you applying that filter? He's asking the same question in a different way. So let's take an example today. I gave the example of ESG documents where scientific publications are published which reference all the same publications and you end up with a, a circle of people saying the same thing and supporting one another. That isn't really your object aim. If your object aim is to have people to examine a broader set of issues in it from a broader perspective. We're seeing the same thing happening on, you know, why is BBC considered to be so, um, so anti-Semitic? Because they're taking data from the RWA or is it RAW? I can't remember. The so-called UN entity that's actually run by Hamas and was completely complicit in the terror attacks of the 7th of October. The BBC treats everything they say as if it's an actual fact and then republishes it. So the source information is super important to be able to analyze. You know, you're not seeing real discussions happening because specific agendas are being driven right from the point of the source, not just the writers. So the question we're both asking you is, how are you going to make this work in such a way that this plays out? Because to your point around staking, what should really happen is that somebody is staking their reputation on what they've said, which is what in traditional print you did. In this context, you're saying, well, stake something of meaning. And all very well and good, but what if you, I mean, if, how are you really evolving that beyond Twitter notes and community notes where you might, for example, have someone say, well, I think it's this, and there's a row breaks out in the background. Actually, if people are willing to put real money on the table and say, no, I, I'm betting, I'm telling you it's this, and I'm prepared to put my wallet where my mouth is, that's different. So what we're both trying to ask you to do is to elucidate that more and clearly. I like the way uh, you present it, and I like the idea of staking. We are already in contact with people who have worked on a staking mechanism for information. I don't know if it's very easy that people will say, okay, now I have one Bitcoin in my wallet, I will bet it on this information um, that it will turn out to be true and I will gain on it, and if I lose, I will lose my Bitcoin. I'm not sure if that will work so easily. Um, so this has to be developed, of course, in some ways. Um, considering the sources, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there will be probably a lot of topics where there are conflicting sources and conflicting viewpoints, and one person says this, one person says that. And it will be not our task to judge, basically, what is the truth. Because the truth, in our opinion, is a process. What we can do is to basically show the whole discussion like you have on Wikipedia around a topic where different sources are presented and no journalist is forced to say it's like this. He can always say, well, there's a conflict, there's maybe this version of a story and another version. It's also a matter of which sources are presented. Is it pictures? Is it videos? Are these videos done with maybe some changes to AI or something else. So there can be conflicts around this, but the most conflicts in the media space are not around these hard facts. It's mainly the problem that we have, that we have a narrative that is pushed through, through mainstream. And if you have a counter narrative or you present other sources, you're just not heard, you're just defamated and sorted out. So it ne this discussion is, we would love to have this discussion, of course, on a platform like this. And we think we should trust our community to, to evaluate in a good way and to show maybe which, which discussion is, uh, is going on and uh, controversial. And at the end, it's a matter of transparency for me. No one should say, this is a fact when it's not a fact and it's disputed. You should show the dispute. But uh, I think as, uh, as adults, we then know how to evaluate this information more or less. <laughs>